today as we come to the table. Again, Jesus said, I'm the door. Does that mean he's a piece of wood with a doorknob? Of course not. But again, the scripture describes to us what he's saying. He goes on to say that I am the door to the kingdom. No one goes in and out to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. No one goes to the Father except by what? By me. I'm the door. You want to get in God's house? you got to come in through the door. And I'm the only door it has. You see, the kingdom has one door. That's it. There aren't multiple doors with different religious names over it. Different spiritual leaders. There is one door in the kingdom. You want to get in? you got to go to that door. And that door is Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. We have a million different windows into the kingdom of heaven. God has shown us his glory again and again through scripture. He displays his awesome creative power with every sunrise. He shares his love through the people around us in small or great ways every single day. He has given us a view of his kingdom. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. We have a million windows into the kingdom of God, but there's only one way to enter it, and that's through the door. In today's message, Pastor Mark is going to show you how Jesus is the door. He is the one and only way to get into the kingdom of God. Each of the windows you've seen has been to show you to the door. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter one with today's edition of Come to the Table. You might say, Mark, how important is it that we stand on Genesis as literal and authoritative and historical? How important is that really? Well, the answer is, it's a matter of life and death for the church. And it's a matter of life and death for the believer. This is a non-negotiable. The church cannot stand strong and will not be strong without it. It's probably part of the reason the church in America is as weak as it is today. Now, I know the church is here. I know the church is alive. And God is working in many churches throughout Knoxville as well as throughout our nation. And God is doing a work. Don't get me wrong. But again, we don't see God moving in our generation the way he did in the early church, do we? Why do we not see God moving that way? Well, part of the reason is, is because we're discrediting the word of God within our own ranks. We're not simply believing what God has said. And we're making God a lot smaller than he is. If Genesis is not true and literal and authoritative and historical, the rest of the Bible is left in a heap of ruins. Now, let me just say this. What do I mean by literal? Because some of you have been coming a while. You heard me say that. Now you're wondering, well, what does he mean by literal? I'm not saying that everything is literal the way it's written. I'm saying that everything has a literal meaning behind it. For example, we see lots of symbols and types in the Scripture. When you look in Revelation, you see, you know, a dragon and a a woman giving birth to a child and the dragon waiting to devour and all this. And you go, whoa, what's that about? Is that literal? Yes, it has a literal meaning. Now, we're not going to see dragons and women giving birth up in the sky, but, but we know from the symbols of the Old Testament, because it's used to describe what Revelation is talking about, it's talking about the nation of Israel represented there in Genesis, which we'll get to later in the story of Joseph. In one of his dreams, the woman with the 12 stars that we see in Revelation, it's the nation of Israel. And it says she's going to be giving birth to the Messiah. And when the Messiah is born, that Satan is going to be waiting to devour the Messiah, to destroy him. What did we see happen? When Jesus was born, which we'll be talking about here on that Wednesday night, as we go through the story of the birth of Christ here at Christmas, what happened? When Herod found out, he went and destroyed all the children two years and younger trying to wipe out the the, the Christ child. Why? Because it was the fulfillment of prophecy, even as the vision of the dragon waiting to destroy as the nation of Israel brought forth the Messiah. And so again, realize there's a lot of symbols used in Scripture, but they have literal meanings behind each and every one of them. Again, Jesus said, I am the door. Does that mean he's a piece of wood with a doorknob? Of course not. But again, the Scripture describes to us what he's saying. He goes on to say that I am the door to the kingdom. No one goes in and out to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. No one goes to the Father except by what? By me. I'm the door. You want to get in God's house? You got to come in through the door. And I'm the only door it has. You see, the kingdom has one door. That's it. 
There aren't multiple doors with different religious names over it. Different spiritual leaders, there is one door in the kingdom. You want to get in? You got to go to that door, and that door is Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about, a very literal meaning to something that is shown symbolically. And we'll see in Revelation where these things are applicable, where, again, it's literal for literal, and then any type of symbolism used. But again, we need to understand the scriptures need to be taken uh, literally. And let me say this, every single quotation of Jesus and the prophets throughout all of the scripture Every one of them are literal and historical and authoritative when quoted. None of them are used any other way. And so for us to take it a different way is to say, well, Lord, you know, I know that you took everything literal, that you took everything, you know, that way and authoritative, whatever. But, but, you know, I, I don't see it that way. And let me explain to you what it really means. Guys, note this. If I say, here's what the word says, but let me tell you what it really means. Who becomes the authority at that point? I do. The word of God is no longer the authority. I have now taken the authority away from God and said, I know it says that, but here's what really, you know, it's only just a symbol of this and this and that. And again, I know there are symbols and types, but understand, we have to realize the authority has to stay in the word of God. That's where the authority belongs, and that's where the authority has to be. The Lord always quotes the scriptures in a literal, historical, and authoritative way. I told you the story about Pastor Chuck a while back where they had a situation in L.A. where uh, they had a professor from a seminary there in L.A., And they were discussing issues of Scripture and whether or not Scripture was really accurate, etc. And he was a professor from a seminary. You would think that he wouldn't be the opposing viewpoint, but he was, to Scripture. He was the opposing viewpoint to Scripture. And he was a a professor from a seminary there in in L.A. And they had Pastor Chuck on as a pastor believing the Bible. And so these two were going to have this kind of on-air debate. And so as they're debating, they're talking, and they're discussing these issues. And this professor says, well, we know there's no prophecy in Scripture that's ever been fulfilled. There's never been prophecy fulfilled in Scripture. It doesn't have any prophecy. And so Pastor Chuck said, wait a minute, you know, what about there in Isaiah where 150 years before Cyrus was even born, God called him by name, and we see history now that it actually came to pass, and, you know, the list goes on. And he goes, well, you see, we know more now. He said, you know, we know, we know more that there were two Isaiahs, and so this Isaiah wrote that after the fact and all this. He says, wait a minute, Jesus declared that the same Isaiah wrote all of Isaiah. And he said, well, you see, now we have more information that Jesus didn't have back then. We have access to, you know, studies that we've done or whatever. And, and it was like suddenly they hear this kind of click and it just goes silent. And so the guy on the radio says, well, apparently we've lost Pastor Chuck here. And so we'll try to get him back. Let's go on a break. And they go on a break and they call Pastor Chuck back up. And he's telling the story. They call him back up and he answers the phone. And he says, so we somehow lost our connection. He says, we didn't lose the connection. I hung up. He says, why did you hang up on a live radio show during this interview? Why would you do that? He said, I really have nothing to say to a man who's smarter than Jesus. And guys, that is exactly the presumption that people take when they say, you know what? The Bible doesn't really say what it says. Let me tell you what it really means. God's word says what it says. And God's word is the authority. Again, where there are symbols and types, it makes itself clear. And so we can make those applications there. But we have to believe the word of God for what it is. Let me give you one example before we move on to the the second point here. And that is this. If Adam was not a literal first man, as Jesus said, Jesus claimed that Adam was literal. And if Adam was not a literal man, and the first man, as the scripture says, who by his sin caused everyone to inherit sin after him. That is, when he fell, we all inherit sin now because of his fall. And the Bible says we are all born sinners because of a literal Adam who fell in sin. Okay? Because of that, we have that. If that is not true, you have no need of a Savior. Because you see, you're not born in sin. And therefore, you need not be born again. And you need not have a Savior. You know, the argument could be made, well, maybe I would sin and I would. But then again, what about the person who says they don't? And I've had people tell me that. I don't sin. The bottom line is, if Adam did not fall, if sin did not enter the world, guys, we have no need for a Savior. The whole reason Jesus Christ came on the cross is because Adam and Eve blew it in the garden. I mean, that was the original Adam bomb, if you will. (laughs) And it's, it's gotten worse ever since. It hasn't gotten any better. All we've done is made a worse a mess of the whole thing. And so understand that how important it is to believe the Scriptures and to understand the Scriptures. Now, secondly, what I want to point out today is Genesis is the book of beginnings. As we go through this book, you're going to see that it is the beginning of everything that exists. Everything that exists can be explained in the book of Genesis, either directly or indirectly by the things it lays out. The book of Genesis means origin. Literally, it means origin, source, or beginning, which is extremely appropriate in light of the fact that Genesis gives us the beginning and origin of all things. 
And I listed a few of them. It's the origin of earth, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, of man, of marriage, of evil, of language, of music, of building, of government, of cultures, of nations, of worship. And the list goes on. But everything that has been created is mentioned in Genesis either directly or indirectly through the passages of creation. It's all accounted for. Now, next, how important is Genesis to the New Testament? Again, we talked about the fact that a lot of people say we don't even need the Old Testament. Well, note this, there are at least 200 direct quotes or allusions to Genesis in the New Testament alone. That's just Genesis, not the rest of the Old Testament. And it's interesting to note that on at least six different occasions, Jesus himself quoted from the first 11 chapters of Genesis, either either in a direct quote or in a reference to it. And even more interesting to note is that each time he spoke of it authoritatively, historically, and literally. He spoke of Jonah. He said, just like Jonah was in the belly of the well, or the belly of the fish, the great fish. He didn't say well, but great fish, three days and three nights. So too will be the Son of Man in the heart of the earth. He didn't say, oh, just like that story or that example about that guy and whatever. No, he said, just like Jonah. He spoke literally. He spoke authoritatively. He spoke historically. And so again, we see the importance of the book of Genesis here, and even Jesus himself showing us that importance. Now, when we look at the writer of Genesis, I think we also need to answer that question, because who was the author of Genesis? Of Genesis. Well, depending on whom you read, if you're a studier, you'll find one of three different answers. That is, they'll say it was either Moses or various writers after Moses, or simply a compilation of ancient records put together from the patriarchs listed in Genesis. Now, again, church history says that it was Moses. My strong leaning is that it was Moses, and uh, the textual evidence points to the fact that it's Moses. But let me say this in reality, it makes no difference. Because in reality, Who really wrote the Bible anyway? God wrote the Bible. And let me just say that oftentimes those who argue over who it was that pinned it down are just trying to somehow pin it to a certain man either way so they can make an argument. No, if we believe it's the Word of God, the instrument used was simply the pencil. You know, when you write your report and you take it to your teacher and you hand it up there, wow, look at this, look what my number two did. What? Yeah, my number two did that for me. What do you think I'll get? What are you talking about your number two? Well, the number two lead pencil, That's it did that. What? You, you're, no, you picked up the pencil and you wrote it. That was just the instrument you used. Well, I don't know. I give all the credit to the number two, but whatever. I'll take my grade, right? They're going to think you're crazy, number one. Let's apply that now to God and God's word. Somebody says, well, you know what, man? Listen, guys, we're all just number twos, all right? The prophets were number twos. Moses was a number two, you know? And so, again, the Lord's number one. He's the one that takes it, picks up the number two, and writes it down. And so that's, that's the important thing to understand It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we have to have that firmly established as well to understand that what we're reading is the word of God when we get into the book of Genesis as well as any other book that we jump into. Now, What is the layout and purpose of Genesis would be our next question. Just for facts sake, Genesis is broken up into two main divisions, chapters 1 through 11, where you have the foundations and the beginnings of all things, including the salvation of fallen man. And then you have uh, chapters 12 through 50, which is God's beginning with Abraham and his special relationship with the nation of Israel. Now, it's also important to note that God never claimed that Genesis was written for the purpose of being a science book. Again, whenever science is mentioned, it is scientifically accurate, as we'll see. So don't take me wrong there. I'm not saying that it's not scientifically accurate. It has never been proven scientifically wrong, although some will say that. There is no evidence at all, nor will there ever be. So I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that wasn't the purpose it was written. God wasn't simply trying to write a science book. He was trying to write how and why he created and then to tell us the story. Now, science fits in there. But God wasn't concerned about that side of it. We wouldn't understand it all anyway. We can't grasp what we already know. Uh, But the bottom line is, God simply wrote it as an instructional book. Again, I'm not saying that it's not scientifically accurate, but it's also important to note that whenever scientific issues are addressed, they are scientifically accurate. And we'll get into more of that later on. Not today, but in future studies. Again, now that brings up another question. Has modern science proven the Bible wrong as some would claim? Guys, you need to know this. As the body of Christ, the answer is no. This is something I've studied and researched for years, and you can do your own. There is no scientific evidence that proves any of the Bible wrong at all. As a matter of fact, the more I get into the science, the more I see that it's God's Word that it proves. 
You know, it's interesting. How often do they update the science books? About every year, they have to make corrections because of mistakes they've made, scientific error they have found. So they make corrections, and, and yet, let me ask you this, over thousands of years of the Scripture, how many times has it had to be updated for corrections? None. And now we know from ancient findings, even dating 300 years before Christ, the Bible has not altered any, even to our present day. The Dead Sea Scrolls put the silence to that argument, and yet it still stands the test of time. For example, the Bible told us thousands of years before man knew it that the earth was round. Man used to think the earth was flat. The Bible declared that it was a sphere, that it was round. Again, man in recent discoveries have discovered the cycles of, of evaporation, that things evaporate from the ocean. They go to the clouds, and the clouds drop it back in the rivers, and the rivers take it back to the ocean so that the consistent flow of water in the rivers and oceans stays the same. We've just recently discovered that in recent history. The Bible tells us exactly that's what the, that's what the process is. Now we've discovered the wind currents around the earth and the way that the earth does all of its different wind currents from the direction, even that it begins to the direction that it ends. There is a set pattern, by the way, of how it travels around the earth, which I didn't know until further study. What's interesting is the Bible lays out that exact pattern to a T. Man didn't discover that until later. It's interesting there was a man who was reading in, in the Psalms where it said, uh, talked about you know, passing through the paths of the sea. And he said, well, you know what? If God's word says there's paths in the sea, I mean, how can there be paths in the sea? It's just water. He said, there's got to be paths in the sea because the Bible says so. And so what did he do? He went to the ocean and began to search. And guess what he found? He found paths in the sea, which to this day are still used by our shipping lines. We go to these paths in our shipping to go from here to Europe and around the world. And there's a water flow. That's, it's like a river within the ocean. And all you do is get in it and ride the wave. And so it's like the jet stream up in the heavens. You can get in that in, in, the, in the planes and travel and get there quicker. They do the same thing now because of the discovery of the paths of the sea. And the reason they even looked for paths in the sea is because Psalms tells us that there is and are paths in the sea. Again, how could, how could the writer of Psalms know that? How could anyone have known these things? Because God knows it, God wrote it, and God is the authority. And so again, it's important to note that scientifically there's no discrepancy at all. Now, again, uh, the next question that needs to be answered is why did God create everything? Scripture declares it was simply for his own pleasure. Why did God create it? Because he just, for his own pleasure, he wanted to do it. Revelation 4.11 says this, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were created. That's why he did it. God, just for his, for his pleasure. You know, that answers a lot of questions right off the bat because you think, why, why did God create such an incredibly vast universe with the stars that we can't even begin to see? They're so far out there, we can't observe them. We can't enjoy them. We can't get any kind of wow out of them. They're way beyond our abilities. Why did God do that? Because he enjoys it. God's there looking at it going, yeah. It's for, you know, it's for his pleasure. Now, the neat thing is we get to be a part of that, don't we? We fit right into the midst of that, it, what his pleasure is, and we enjoy what he's created and his beauty. And the last question that will be answered as we get into this study is how did God create? Well, we'll do that in, in week two or week three of this study, so we'll let God's word describe that as he gets into how he created. But let's look at verse one today as we finally make it to verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now this phrase, in the beginning, is one of the hardest things for us to understand with our limited mind and our limited understanding. And why is that? Because it declares that God was there before the beginning, which implies that God has always existed before the beginning even began, whatever that was, which he's going to tell us. But the point is, here's what it says. In that one line sentence, that one verse, it says, God's eternal and has always been around. He has no beginning, he has no end, and the rest of the scripture backs it up. Guys, that's one that'll drive you crazy. Your mind cannot comprehend how God could have always been there. And that's a question I think the kids ask, who made God? You know, who created him? You know, how did he get there? God doesn't tell us. And even if he did tell us, the question is, could we really understand it? Guys, here's where we run into problems. We try to understand an, a non-understandable God. The Bible says His ways are higher than our ways. And so there's no way we can completely understand God. We can't understand all of His creation, all that He's done. We can't understand how He is just here. He calls Himself the great I Am. That is, He simply just exists. We can't grasp it. Our mind is too small. And it's amazing to think that we would stumble with that when you realize how little our mind is and how vast our God is. You know, it's been said that if God is small enough to understand, then he's not big enough to be God. 
and th- our mind can't grasp it. So we simply take it by faith. God said it, we believe it, and he backs it up with his word and with reality. And yet I would dare say that once we become spiritual beings and we enter into the kingdom of God, we're going to have a greater understanding. At that point, we may actually grasp how God has always existed. We'll have to see when that time comes. But secondly, notice here, in the beginning, God. The word for God here is the word Elohim, which is very interesting in the Hebrew language. Now, when you come across a Hebrew word that ends in I am, that's the plural. It's like in our language, you have the S at the end of a plural. You have basketball or basketballs. You put an S on the end of it. So it means plural. The same thing is true with Im in the Hebrew. Elo would simply be one Elohim is going to be plural. Now, right off the bat, you say, but wait a minute, there's only one God. Why would God use a plural term at the very start of the Bible, the very first sentence of the Bible, to describe himself in the plural form when when God is one? Because although God is one, the Bible teaches he is made up of a trinity. He is made up of three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even as we can't grasp how God has always existed and will always exist, we can't grasp the trinity. Now, I know we try it, and all you guys will come up with your great little analogies, and they are good. You know, it's like the egg, you got the white part, you know, then the yolk, and then the little the yellow around there, which is, you know, has to be God, because that has no purpose, doesn't, no taste, no flavor. The point is, is that I know, and those are good analogies, don't get me wrong, but for the person who's really trying to grasp one God in three different persons, that just doesn't do it. And you can't do it. Those, use those illustrations. They're good. And that that helps people to understand the picture of one being multiple. But at the same time, we can't grasp it. It's something that God simply declares, and it's something that we can't grasp. And some say the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I want to give you one example beyond this one, and that is in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now note that word. The Lord is one. He's declaring, I am one. But it's a very interesting word that he uses here in the language. For the word one in the Hebrew, there are two words that are used. There is yakid and ekad. They're the two words that are used to describe the word one in the Hebrew language. What is yakid? Yakid means absolute one. There cannot be anything added to it. It's like I'm holding up yakid finger. One. That is it. There can't, can't be added to. It's just that's it. That's all you've got. Yakid. The other word in the Hebrew is the word ekad. And it means literally compound unity. In other words, it's one, but it's multiple parts. For example, I'm holding up how many hands? I have one hand, but on this hand, I have how many fingers? Five. My hand is, in the Hebrew, if you will, ekad. Okay? That is, it is, a, it is a single unit, but it has multiple parts. Guess which one God used here in Deuteronomy 6.4? God did not say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is yakid. If God had said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is yakid, Trinity's out the window. Forget the Trinity because that would seal the case. It means absolute one. It cannot have multiple parts. Case closed. God said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is echad. That is compound unity. That is multiple parts. And yet I am still one. Powerful. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's Word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis, and there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse 1, God made it clear that He was there all along, and He set things in motion exactly as He instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. 
feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.